today for this uh, seminar on standards and quality of installation of solar PV rooftop projects, uh, especially focusing on best practices. Uh, as we all know, solar PV is, uh, is an ideal distributed energy resource. And this of course means that uh, a significant percentage uh, already of, of solar PV already is on rooftop locations and will continue to be that way. So it will, uh, so rooftop PV for all types of uh, ac activities, both off-grid and on-grid are gonna be a significant uh, feature of our business over the next uh, coming decades. And so I'm very pleased that we have five speakers here today to talk about various aspects of rooftop solar, um, including the improved technological efficiency of the solar industry overall and the solar panels overall, how solar PV power can come to provide power to communities that are not connected to the grid, uh, and also the establishment of smart cities and smart grids with the aid of solar PV systems and the reliability of solar systems and safety certification of installer recommendations. So I'd like to introduce the first of five speakers. This is uh, Sean White, who I think is standing there ready to talk. Sean is a solar energy professor. He's a consultant and an author. I've known him for many years. He's been teaching solar and energy storage classes full-time for uh, the last 15 years and speaks at conferences, teaches at workshops on codes, standards, and the fundamentals of solar PV. He's taught in many places around the world, US, China, India, Italy, the Seychelles, Philippines, Mongolia, Africa, many other countries, too many to list here. He's authored eight books on solar and storage and published, and, and most of the students in the last few years have been online through the uh, HeatSpring platform, but we're happy to have Sean here personally to give us his perspectives on uh, quality installation of solar PV. Sean, it's over to you. Thanks, Dave. And um, it, it, it's good to know Dave. Um, we've spent some time together, even in India ourselves. We had a, we had a fun time over there. But um, anyway, today is Solutions Day, and this is all about solutions. We're going to solve the climate problem here with solar and wind at this pavilion. <clears throat> and, um, and so another thing is I have to be kind of quick. So let me take a look at that clock there. And the reason I have to be quick is the time it takes the sunlight to get to Earth from the sun, that's how much time I have. So photons are fast. <clears throat> so what we're talking about is best practices. I'm Sean White, Dave did the introduction. So let's see if we can move to the next slide here. Okay, a uh, different way to navigate. And so what we're looking, what I wanted to start off with first is why rooftop PV? So I'm not against wind, I'm not against utility scale PV, but I really like rooftop PV because normal people can participate in climate solutions. Um, it's on your house, it's down home. Um, it, it creates more jobs where people live <clears throat> because when they're building big solar farms, it's, it's way out in the desert somewhere. Somebody has to go live there for a little small amount of time and then they go home and move to some other place. Um, the utility is no longer a natural monopoly, a lot like our cell phones. Um, nobody, has, nobody uses a landline anymore. That's what we're going to do with energy. And also, it's distributed generation, kind of what we're talking about, rooftop, rooftop solar. You make it where you use it. And one of the things that I want to get into, especially on the next slide, we're going to talk about power quality, virtual power plants, and things like that. And my prediction is rooftop PV and electric vehicles. So I have 85 kilowatt hours sitting at my house for weeks, not doing anything. What a waste. <clears throat> um, what we're going to have soon enough, because we're going to have to have this, is we're going to have electric vehicles that are bi-directional, supporting the grid, supporting the power quality, um, networked together with lots of different batteries. And it's like we have batteries on wheels. What better thing can we have than that? <clears throat> And so here's just some of the things that we're seeing people install now with good standards and quality practices. And so you can get an inverter now that you just plug in an EV charger to it. And if there's not, a, if there's not enough current coming from the utility, 
If the sun's out, you can add that sun so you can charge faster that way. Pretty amazing how that works. And so instead of just having a regular battery at your house, when you're home, your car's home, and eventually your old car is just gonna be sitting there. Um, we, we talk about second life electric vehicle batteries. And so that looks a lot like my 85 kilowatt hour battery on wheels right there that unfortunately, I'm not able to do this. But one of the things that's kind of exciting is we have Duke Energy working with um, 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 Ford, Duke Energy and Ford, so a big utility, one of the bigger utilities in the United States, working with Ford um, to help support the grid with the electric vehicles. So it's something that's just going to have to happen. Um, I wanted to do it ahead of time. So two years ago, I connected, it, I really didn't use my car because it would have voided the warranty. So I had a loaner car when mine was getting repaired and I put 70 watts into the grid. So now I could be saying I've been doing EV to grid for um, since 2020, sooner than before anybody. Just don't, don't tell anybody though. I might have, I might get in trouble. Um, so one of the things that I wanna just kind of show you the math for some of this is, um, and, and I'm not gonna go through all the calculations, but if I took like the average usage of a house, you know, that has solar on it, 10,000 kilowatt hours per year, and I calculated the current, that's only five amps continuous. And so we, we have all these ups and downs when we're drawing current and, and, and sometimes we're sending that current back. But if we looked at the utility as just another source and we could only draw five amps from it, but then we can offset that with solar. And then we have these big old, you know, big batteries. In fact, my girlfriend has an electric car too. So between us, we probably have 150 kilowatt hours sitting there that we only use 20% of on a regular basis. And so that's five amps continuous, that's not very much. And so I just did this other little calculation here and I there's 70 million cars sold per year. And pretty soon it's gonna be not smart to buy anything that's not an electric vehicle. It's just like you see somebody buying an internal combustion engine, that's just not smart at all. And so if we took um, 70 million cars, check. <laughs> that was some feedback. Um, 65 kilowatt hours per car, just throwing a number out there. That's four and a half terawatt hours of four-wheeled storage. And we connect that to the grid with all of our solar systems. So let me get to more onto the standards and quality and best practices. Um, when we're installing all these things, we want to make sure that we our systems work, they make profits, that they're safe, that there's insurance, that they're bankable, that there's no stories about fires. <clears throat> and so there, there's all these different wire colors and things like that. I usually study the national electrical code, but at, sometimes I go to places where we, we work with the International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, and there's a lot of places that do the British wiring standards, places that are formal, former British colonies. And, um, and so I'm writing a book right now, third edition PV in the NEC and um, with my good friend, Bill Brooks. And, um, and so there, these codes are really important to follow um, to make sure that all the systems are safe, the houses don't burn down so you don't get in the news. Um, and one of the things that's kind of crazy is that in the United States right now that they figured out that the permitting costs for a PV system for residential is $1 per watt. That's more than the price of a utility scale PV system, dollar per watt, crazy. So I heard John Kerry's here, somebody tell him about that. He's got to get that changed. <laughs> I saw him yesterday. <laughs> and then, um, and so a dollar per watt, if you wanted to, and also if you wanted to read about this, you can go to my website, solarshawn.com. These links are clickable. It's a PDF download and you can get this presentation. And, um, and so with all these different permitting costs, it should be free. And that's how we're gonna help solve the climate crisis is to get these costs way down. <clears throat> um, and so another thing that I'm known for is certifications. And so the, the, the biggest certification body that I know of in the world, you know, there might be one in a different galaxy is NABCEP. And so I get people NABCEP certified there's all these different certifications here for, uh, for PV. They're working on an energy storage one. 
Um, and so they, and they also do live online proctoring. So you can take these exams from anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and so here's just some more rooftop PV. That's on the airport that I fly into um, next week. There it is. That's um, 10 year old PV. This is called LIDAR. We can do shade analysis. <clears throat> That's um, laser echoes from an airplane. These are some um, flashings that my friend invented for tile roofs. Um, he, he struck it rich. Um, there's um, wind deflectors on a ballasted system, um, PV clamp to a metal roof, it's an interesting application. And there we go, the Inca Trail, a little bit about off-grid PV. And if they can live off-grid with solar, so can everybody else in the world. You know, and you know, in fact, I was doing that in the 90s. <clears throat> um, and and so here we have ballasted PV, not even screwed onto a roof, but wind tunnel tested, and before the hurricane and after the hurricane, most of it stayed there. So pretty neat. There's building integrated photovoltaic. It's too expensive, in my opinion, but it's really neat to look at. That was um 15 years ago at SunTech. Um, there's some 40 year old building integrated photovoltaic, so it's part of the roof. It's always neat to look at, but then when you find out the price, maybe not as neat. And an east west system, so you can get more morning and afternoon PV. It's good for the wind tunneling effect. And here we go. I think the light just got here from the sun that I was telling you about a little bit before. And um, so I want to propose a UN resolution right now is to raise the set point of the air conditioning at all UN conferences by 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same as one and a half degrees Celsius. And that will help lower the temperature outside, which is what we're all here for. So, um, and, and, and that's another thing too, for any Americans out there, don't say the Celsius number. Everybody talks about Fahrenheit. The news is talking about, it's gonna be this temperature Fahrenheit tomorrow and that temperature Fahrenheit tomorrow. And then all of a sudden they talk about climate change and they say one and a half degrees and it's different. There's di and so it's 2.7 and this is COP27. And um, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, very, you crammed a lot of it, good information and uh, the mm -hmm. time it takes for the sunlight to reach the earth. Um, and let's hope that the, uh, the electric utility systems around the world start to accept the idea of having so much inherent storage in electric vehicles to be able for it to allow them to be able to make good use of it. Okay, our next speaker is Saba Kalam. He's a program specialist at the International Solar Alliance, and he's heading up the ISA flagship program called Solar Technology Application Resource Center. And he's a climate and energy professional with 17 years of experience in developing and implementing large scale programs and projects on renewable energy efficiency and climate change. Saba, I'll turn the floor to you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk more from the perspective of the developing countries and the, the NDCs and the SIDS. Uh, as part of the International Solar Alliance, uh, my job is to build the capacity of the member countries. We have about 110 member countries right now. So we are working with LDCs, we are working with SIDS, mainly in Africa, uh, Caribbean, Latin America. Asia Pacific, all, mostly global south, I would say. Yeah, so we are working with them. And we realize that how standards play a, such an important role when we talk about the accelerated deployment of, of the solar energy. And I'll give you just few examples to, to tell you what's happening right now and what exactly we need to do as well. Uh, I'll start with, a personal opinion, of course, uh, it's not an ISA opinion, a personal opinion that right now, if you see the entire solar industry, I mean, 10 years back, there was a lot of, lot of demand coming up from, from the developed countries, Germany, mainly Europe, somewhat Asia as well, India, China. But now largely it's becoming very supply driven where the, you, have, you find a lot of manufacturers coming up with solar components, 
So a lot of manufacturers coming up with solar components, uh, uh, solar applications, all of that. Now, what is happening is that you have really standardized products, good products, and you have some cheap products as well. In solar energy, the cost matters. Cost matters both for off-grid as well as for the grid connected as well. Now, in the grid connected, what's happening is that for countries in Africa, for a country like, say, uh, Ethiopia or, or, or DRC, they're getting solar panels from China or from some different other places. So the top peak rated solar panels that they get for, say, 320p, but when it lands in uh, Ethiopia, the output is, is not even half of what is what it is rated for. But unfortunately, these countries don't have the testing facilities, testing mechanisms to test. So whatever they receive is they have to live with that only. Now, what International Solar Alliance is doing right now is, is setting up a solar technology application resource centers in most of these member countries where we are trying to help the countries to undergo the energy transition on their own. Because largely what we have seen is that a lot of developed countries are supporting the developing countries or the underdeveloped countries. But how long it will last? How much money we are going to spend in that? People who, uh, companies or people who really want to build capacities of, of these smaller countries, they travel to these countries, they offer trainings. But these are really costly. These are these are not very easy for the countries to handle. So ISA has come up with the Solar Technology Application Resource Center initiative, which is to set up these star centers in, in most of the member countries. Now, one of the functions, there are four functions of these star centers. One of the function is to help the countries undertake testing, testing of solar components and solar applications. Now, by that, by doing that, the countries are going to be at least self-sustainable in the sense that they will be able to see whatever panels, whatever components, whatever applications they are buying from the international market. Are these really worth paying the amount of money that they are paying right now or not? So that's where we are trying to make a, a small dent uh, uh, within the member countries. I'll just talk a little bit about uh, uh, the experience what I have had in, in India. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the grid connected and then the off grid or the decentralized renewable energy. Yeah, apart from the quality and the performance issues uh, in absence of standards, there are large safety issues uh, if, if you don't have really good standards. And the, and the and the byproduct, if you don't have good standards, is large amount of waste, yeah, and which is so going to happen in countries like India, where you are actually talking about deploying, deploying solar energy at gigawatt scale, where you have target for 100 gigawatt, 200 gigawatt. But if you don't have right standards, that means that in, in 10 years, 15 years down the line, or even before that, even you are going to have a huge, huge amount of ways that you won't be able to handle. So not only solar components or solar application standards are required, how you handle the waste stand with a standard, with a proper standard is also required right now because we don't want to end up, because when you procure, when you procure the solar components, you need to have standards which actually helps you to dispose that in a better manner so that you don't have large amount of unsustainable waste. So that's mostly for the for the, for the uh, connected large solar power plants. It becomes even more important for the off-grid or for the decentralized uh, uh, solar power, uh, especially for countries like India where you are having uh, as one of the pictures which Shams shown, I think that was from India, I don't know. But that is what is happening is that people who don't have the access to electricity are largely depending on, on, on the solar energy. They are having these small, small panels, uh, 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 either half kilowatt or one kilowatt panels that they install over their roof and they take energy from, from these solar panels. Now, as I said at the beginning, that you have all kinds of products. You have really, I mean, good standard products, which are, of course, costly compared to the cheaper version that you get from many other places. 
If you don't have national standards and, and these national standards are not enforced, then people, of course, who don't have about solar energy or people who live in villages, they tend to, have, they tend to buy cheaper products. Yeah, and when you have cheaper products, you also have a bad experience. And bad experiences are advertised more than the good experiences. So, which means that going forward, the adoption is going to be a problem because if you don't have really good standards which are adopted by, by these people who don't know actually about solar energy, they're going to buy cheap products and that's going to fail. And people who are actually looking at replicating these ideas or really trying to buy the solar panels because they also want to, to have the access to electricity, if they see that as a bad example, they're not going to take that up. Which of course means that you will have disruptors right now and you can push as much as you can, but going forward, you will have disruptions in the form of sales going down and the demand going down for the solar energy. So at the national level and even at the provincial level, I think the adoption of standards is, is very important for, for the decentralized solar energy. One, one example I would like to just give you before I close, I hope I'm, I'm not looking at my time, so I don't know how much time I have consumed. But I'll just give you an example of, of, a, of an application, which is a very important application for countries in Africa, even for India, which are solar coal storages. Yeah. So these are basically mobile coal storages that you park at, at the farm level. And a lot of farmers use these solar, these coal storages, depending on the produce that they have. But different kind of produce give you different payback time. But produces like flowers, yeah, mainly the floriculture which is done. I'll just give you a very small example of a small town in uh, in in India, uh, within a state which is which is called Maharashtra. Now there is a huge, there is a huge huge farms for for flowers, and there are farmers who grow flowers. The nearest market for them to sell these flowers are almost like five to six hours. Uh, uh, they take about five to six hours to reach, which means that the day they harvest these flowers, they have to sell these flowers without negotiating the price of the flowers. But if they negotiate, if they keep the flowers for a day, for two days, for three days, they'll be able to at least get 30% to 40% more than what they usually get when they sell out without bargaining the price. Now we were doing a project. I was as part of another organization. We were doing a project. We actually introduced a very efficient, standardized solar coal storage for a couple of farmers there because it gave them the payback of about one and a half years. And there are thousands of farmers there who want such coal storages to gain bargaining power and to, to negotiate the price, hold back the produce for two days, negotiate the price, and then sell it to the market. Now, seeing that the demand suddenly goes up for, for the solar coal storages, and a couple of more farmers bought it, seeing that the suppliers of the solar coal storage became very really active in that region, and they really provided, I mean, it was, it was costing about, if I, if I remember fairly, one solar coal storage was costing about $20,000. So the cost came down to about, Ten thousand dollars, and these were really cheap products. Yeah, really, really cheap products. Not only in terms of the solar panels, also because there was no standards. And India has huge flower market. Yeah, which means that a lot of, I mean, these florists are are in touch with each other. So, one person who is buying in in one corner of India is going to be consulted by another person who is who is also doing the same thing in in another part of India. So suddenly the, 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 the price came down, but the quality was really bad. And, and people who were actually uh, buying these products, these products started to fail in, in two years' time. So without giving them enough time to get the payback, I mean, these products started to fail down. So when it became a huge number that the government realized that we, they, real, they really need to have some standards as well for, for solar coal storages. Now, I mean, India has standards for solar coal storages and people. So what I mean to say is that one bad example that that is that is showcased, I mean, becomes a very bad advertisement for any future adoption. So standards, of course, are important for for EVs, for 
large scale solar deployment for off for, for grid connected solar for megawatt gigawatt scale but it's equally important for decentralized solar energy as well that's it from my side thank you all right thank you saba especially for that very interesting case study that you just described to us our next speaker now is uh, David Vedapol. He's a managing director of the international affairs at BSW Solar. This is a German solar association. David began his career as a radio journalist and um, studied on both worked on both sides of the Atlantic. He is now the position of managing director of international affairs at BSW and is responsible for the association's international activities, including projects in Northwest and Southern Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and the U.S. David, turn it over to you. Ooh, um, and hello, I might even be loud enough without amplification here. Um, so you have a clicker of some sort? So my role here is to be the, the, the non-engineer, um, but we do have some experience and, and hearing you I agree that if you are working under the um, conditions that you have in, in your home market, you spoke to India, and you need particular, you need particularly high standards and, and not the lowest standards, but I know that some of these markets are what I would call very price sensitive. So, um, brief word about us, uh, we're in the business for 43 years. Um, we represent the entire value chain, and this year we have added a member each working day of this year. That tells you something about how the uh, market is growing in Europe and in Germany in particular. And, and one thing that is curious about us uh, that was mentioned, we not only were a regular industry association, but we work abroad, we work with a lot of partners, and we, we work in a lot of difficult markets, um, so to say. But, um, so what's happening in Germany, we're at an all-time high. I think that is not a big uh, surprise, but demand is um, uh, with all of our companies. This is the business index, business climate um, that we've been doing. And um, this reflects the demand. And here is the reason the market is... The market is growing like um, like crazy, like we haven't seen. We have already had insulation rates of almost eight gigawatts, uh, and then we had what was the value of tiers uh, when the market really slumped in Germany. But we are back up to about the same level of insulation, and we recently had a new government move. Um, which means our uh, current target until 2030 is 215 gigawatt uh, of peak power of PV. So that's to compare India, 2030 target is 350, Germany um, 215, which means we're going to have to add um, 12, 18, 20 gigawatts a year very, very soon and um, because that is very, very soon. I think somebody else is going to talk about efficiency, right? Module efficiency. This was just asked. I just wanted to add, um, it, do it doesn't come out here really quick. It doesn't come out here really well, but you see the efficiency rate for the different um, technologies that, uh, that are out there. We, we're seeing a renaissance of production in, in Europe and North America and other places. And we see that people are experimenting with different technologies um, as well. We're used to that. That was the case 10 years ago. Um, but we see people branch out and we are seeing developments in you know, real world applications where we um, really highlight uh, the efficiency um, of the modules and bringing the cost down and the usage of, of material. But uh, you pointed um, to the problem. Uh, of having maybe a fire efficient uh, quality. So the day was January 9th, 2010, and a room house in a, uh, in a village in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia burned, and there was a fireman standing in front of the building in front of a camera, 
and the building was lingering in the back room, and the fireman said we couldn't put out the fire because there was a solar system on the roof and we couldn't shut it, shut it down. Now, this was not a PV system. This was a solar thermal system, as it later turned out. It had nothing to do with the fire, but it pointed to a problem, and it was national news, um, and it was a big reputational problem that took us month to resolve, even though we had a notarized statement of the owner of the building that they never had a PV system, and so on and so on. It didn't matter because you had a fireman in front of the building saying, we have to let that building down. So what we did is we work with the fire department, and these guys have seen it all. And as you know, if there are safety in if there are faults in the manufacturer of the product or in the way it is installed, indeed, um, it can lead to fires. And we have done all sorts of field tests and experiments also in extinguishing a fire. If you have a building that is on fire, you have the electric fire from the PD system, so not to um, endanger the uh, the firemen. So it's very, very important reputation-wise, and you spoke about uh, you know, markets where solar might be new. So if people see it failed, you pointed to the waste that is there. But um, what is much worse than waste is the reputation of damage if you have property damage or even loss of life, which fortunately we didn't, inshallah. Yeah. Um, so we really learned installation quality. This is Germany, uh, wind uh, speed. Um, you have um, failures in the construction. Um, you really um, have failures in the cell, a cell sorting a problem uh, where you have resistance between uh, the cells that burn through. Um, and we also learned that surveillance of the system, of the running systems over time is extremely important. There are, some, there are things that you are aware of you can do with drones. There's great software out there that will monitor your plan and that will warn you if something goes wrong or is about to go wrong. So look, just not let it sit there. The, the, the least bad thing that can happen is you lose some of the energy, you lose some of the investment, but the worst thing that can happen is um, you can lose some, uh, some property. And you know, modules are able to withstand a lot, but um, it, it matters, the lamination matters over time. We have systems in the field in Germany, you've, you've, you've had the picture with a 40 year old system. We have systems in the field for over 40 years, even open, open field uh, system. And it, it's really important, the mounting, that these details really, really uh, matter. Um, you know, how you bend your cables um, over time. Uh, and the UV radiation in, in uh, Northern Europe, where Germany is located, you have things like hail. Yeah, other countries will have sandstorms. So really the environmental hazards are important because these systems are going to be there over time. It's not a one-time uh, investment you make for a year or so, but this is always a decade-long investment at least um, uh, when that is the case. Um, you spoke about off-grid and access to electricity, but in developed markets like, like ours, it's really important that you have, um, maybe this is better. Um, so you have grid management because we have areas in our grid where you already have 100% at times fluctuating energy. Wind and solar with Germany. We don't have any other reason. All hydro was built in the 70s. There is no more hydro potential. You can do some repon. And so it's really important what you do, what the inverters are able to do, and the um, metering and the type of information you have about what's going on in your grid. 2013, we had a, a, um, a solar eclipse in southern Germany. Um, at the time, we didn't have as much PV as we have now, but we had a ramp up of well, 15 making the decision. I think it was in the very hard state alone. In the history. So we really had to prepare for that. And it's something that's really interesting uh, to look at from a grid management um, perspective. So the other thing is prediction. Prediction has gone. Yeah, because the, is, the more information you have, you aggregate from the inverters to see. Uh, 
Um, in prediction, it's a little bit like the weather. Uh, you know, we a week from now, who knows? Three days, you really know next up, I'm going to be, you know what's up, you really know what's coming. And that is from a country that has a grid downtime on average of 11 minutes annually. And so, Really, Some, I don't understand why people mm -hmm. install so many batteries, home batteries for the back of the war. In Germany's new home systems, 60% installed with batteries, 50% with EV chargers like you showed. And so that's a really, really a big trend. Mm -hmm. And I think 70% of 70 percent of the 64 gigawatts of power that we have on the grid are on the roof. Now that is going to change if we're going to 215, because in seven, eight years, we can't build all these systems on the roof. I, I agree with you that, you know, most power should be there and creates most jobs if it is on the roof. But if you need this massive deployment, you need both. I'm trying to rush. Um, so there are definitely also requirements that should be there. Uh, if you are presuming, if you're using the energy directly, if you're utilizing your electric car or the home battery uh, that you have, um, and you can do that to also centralize, um, you can use the inverters to stabilize the grid. And one thing we must bear in mind is cybersecurity. We've had some issues in European grids with bad actors towards large um, scale plants, but who knows if somebody will try this with inverters, uh, even though, you know, for on a security aspect, it's better to have distributed energy. And to close, eight minutes are over. Um, I look forward to the exchange with you. And as I like to say, uh, the energy given the mostly, the energy transition mostly is an engineering problem. So fortunately, you're talking to the Germans, and I caught you talking to solar about Germans, with Germans about solar. Why are you talking to Germans about solar? Yeah, why is that? It's, it's a little bit uh, crazy, but the reason is we've been doing this for so long that a lot of these things have already happened, or we've had these problems already. We don't always have a solution. We might not always have a solution that fits the particular situation, but we certainly had all uh, had, had most of the problems uh, that that um, are there. And one thing, uh, it's not working anymore. Somebody could scroll for me. Otherwise, I'm just going to say it. I wanted to invite you to uh, attend the Smarter E. Huh? Next one, next one, the Smarter E, Europe's Smarter E. Uh, no, last slide. Really? Okay, I'm going to hold this. The, the Smarter E, uh, which is um, the largest energy fair in Europe. Uh, I just heard from them today that they booked more halls because they're booked out solid june 14th to june 16th please approach me for tickets if you want to uh, or if you want to do some common activity there here we are fantastic thank you so much and please if you want to my, my contacts are here i hope to see you there at the latest take care Thank you very much, David. Uh, you've given us very compelling evidence of the importance of following good standards and quality installation procedures. Um, now, I would like to introduce, I believe he's coming into us here online, Engineer Hamid Pur Muhammad. He's an electrical engineer with a Master of Engineering Management. And um, He's been working in many high profile infrastructure projects in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, he's one of the first engineers certified for solar projects in the UAE, and he led the team to deliver multiple turnkey solar rooftop, carport, and ground mounting projects. So, Hamid, uh, thank you for your participation. I hope we can hear you here now. Thank you, Doctor, for introduction. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, I really uh, appreciate being here and presenting about solar rooftop and carport and uh, distributed solar systems. 
So I can uh, see a lot of, uh, you know, standards and qualities uh, uh, and also in installation procedures and uh, faults that uh, all the uh, panelists described. Uh, I try now to introduce one of the solution uh, because we experience a lot of uh, problems during the installations. No, one of the major solution can ease uh, the, uh, uh, the problems from the design till the uh, you know, commissioning of the project. And when talking about the power uh, solar system, we are talking about like 25 years, 240 years, uh, as previously mentioned. You know, we are talking about generation of energy for 20, five years as a minimum, you know, uh, which everybody gives guarantee and the system should be bankable. So here we are going to talk mostly about uh, optimizer systems uh, against string inverters, which are used uh, in most of the solar systems. So, uh, Talking uh, 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 to elaborate further, you know, the, uh, the difference of string inverters, uh, a little bit technical comparing to other presentations here. Uh, when talking about string inverters, you know, as you know, uh, a lot of modules are series connected to a string and then through an MPPT is connected to inverters. So we uh, each string carries up to 1000 volt DC, which can be sometimes very much crucial. It can lead to a huge fire in, in terms of safety. Uh, we have seen a lot of photos, uh, you know, which uh, uh, happen to uh, like have uh, to see even, even uh, not from the solar system, from the neighboring, uh, it can happen fires. So those are the problems of high voltage system, which solar PV, a small solar PV can create on top of the roofs or car parks or uh, even ground mount systems. So here we have, you know, like for each solar panel, there is a, a voltage of 40 volts. So each string carries around 20 to uh, 25 panels, all serried and connected to the inverters. So if one of the, uh, we are talking about efficiency of optimizer system comparing to the string inverters here. So, but in once we have here, we uh, for each inverter, we might have two MPPT or three MPPTs or some of the inverter like bigger 100 uh, kilowatt uh, inverters, the string of inverters, they carry up to six MPPTs. But when talking to, uh, when talking about optimizer, we can have up to, uh, each panel level, uh, you know, an optimizer, and we can, uh, you know, like uh, control and monitor each generation of solar uh, of every solar panels, so and optimize them. Uh, so, uh, to, uh, of course, you know, the cost reduction uh, to be considered and system to be optimized. Uh, there, there is a little bit of uh, cost. Uh, uh, capital actually required for additional optimizer uh, from the uh, in, uh, from the start of the project. So to to avoid this, op uh, two panels can be connected, and instead of you look like a uh, single panel, so the price can be minimized a little bit. So each two panel can be like one MPPT, one optimizer, and, and instead of you know like having single. Uh, a string for 20, 25 panels, we can have up to 12 or even 20 optimizers. To elaborate this a little bit more, you know, we will uh, discuss uh, this. Uh, we will give an example of, uh, you know, a rooftop. See, it, 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 even in a small rooftop, you can have a lot of orientations and single inverters doesn't have uh, uh, more than any uh, two MPPTs. And if there are three, or for orientation, always they will carry different uh, generations uh, on each side of the panel uh, due to the orientation uh, toward the sun. Uh, but optimizer, it can be installed up to uh, next to the solar panel level and optimize each gener generation of each solar panel and connect to the inverters. So uh, to elaborate this again further, so in, uh, as we discussed, you know, each string can carry uh, like 20 panels, 
now we gave examples, uh, you know, like, uh, as you can see, even for four panels, if one of the panels are shaded or uh, a little bit, uh, you know, it's not cleaned among all of the panels in the string. So the generation of whole string, it will be much less. Suppose you have four panels, as you can see the driver, one of the panels are not generating as it should be. So instead of 500 watt peak, it generates 50 watt. But this, in terms of a string inverters, it gives you, you know, it forces all other uh, players, all other modules also uh, to set to 50 watt peak. So we will be having like four panels or four uh, sets of, uh, or uh, even in the string, it will be like 20, 20 ones. Now here we gave an example of four of them. So we will be having only 200 watt peak However, others are performing at their best. So it's, instead of having 1,550 watt peak uh, as an optimized system, because all other three are uh, at their best and they're generating like 500 watt peak. So this, uh, you know, through 25 years, if you look at this generations and, uh, you know, uh, how much deduction and safety and quality of the, uh, you know, uh, yield generation, it will be reduced through this. So to elaborate this again further, you know, like to compare even that, uh, if we said we have in a, a, a standard, very unique uh, systems, you know, even with panels which are packed from the factories, you know, each of them considering, you know, a panel of uh, 280 watt peak, we can see in the photo three of the panels, none of them are just uh, giving like uh, 280 watt peak. So one is giving 269, uh, another is 278, and the third one is 265. In terms of a string, if we have 20 of them, we can never achieve the best of each panel. So what, uh, what optimizer does, it just gets best stuff out of each panel, you know, to have the best generation possible so energy losses will be very much limited once utilizing what once installing and designing the uh, with optimizers so uh, the good thing uh, the design flexibilities are there so once we use the optimizer on top of the roof uh, you know multiple orientations it can be utilized with a single inverter suppose uh, suppose we have like one rooftop with uh, you know like uh, 200 panels with different orientation with single uh, op uh, single optimized, uh, you know, like uh, inverters. So all those uh, uh, optimizer will be on top of the roof and we don't need to have like multiple inverters to have multiple MPPTs. Just we easily, we can just design the panel on top of the roof without considering anything and just connecting uh, the optimizer to the systems. And once we uh, in installing the optimizer control through to, through uh, 25 years of monitoring of each solar panel, suppose after five years, one of the panel in one of the strings is not performing well. In terms of string inverters, you know, a lot of effort needed, you know, to uh, cut that string and, uh, you know, just find uh, to fault find uh, of where the location of the solar panels among the uh, all that 200 panels. But in terms of uh, 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 optimizer system, you can easily identify through monitoring system, which of the uh, which panel are like uh, uh, faulty and give the solutions. So here is a further, you know, explanation. You can see, you know, suppose we have like a small house with a car park, with a rooftop. And in terms of string inverters, we, we must need, uh, you know, uh, uh, different inverters for each locations. But uh, once uh, uh, an installing optimizer nearby the panels, we can, uh, you know, combine all of them and have easy solution and without any worries for 25 years of design. So uh, the, as the time is limited, I cannot go further into the uh, discussion. I just give uh, just a live example. This is uh, uh, the installations of uh, one of the roofs in uh, 
Dubai Chamber, you know, uh, it was very much complicated. It's, it's a huge, uh, you know, a structure. So we put on top of uh, uh, the structure, you know, like uh, it's a circular one. Uh, unfortunately, we, we installed this without uh, optimizer system, but uh, like this part of the uh, system, it was around 450 kilowatt. For this 450 kilowatt, we used around 12, 12 string inverters to optimize the system and get like around 24 MPPTs. So for still, still our generation is less than half of the uh, you know expected uh, if uh, optimizer system utilized for this, because as you can see, just every small location there are different orientations. Beside that, there is another you know tower. Sometimes sh a shading on the panel, and this shade is rotating through the uh, structure. So we we are facing a lot of challenges, but. If uh, you know optimizer system used for this like 800 panels, we could have like 400 MPPTs to have like a very much optimized system uh, with the with the less uh, you know like uh, problems and uh, uh, loss of the energy. So this is another examples you know just uh, with optimizing uh, you know. Uh, with optimizer system, you can have unique, easy design system, uh, different multiple hundred kilowatt inverters you can put in any of the location and you can pull the cables. So there are a lot of advantages with the string inverters because uh, we can talk about like rapid shutdown. Suppose there is a, a fire on top of one of these installations. So uh, the function of uh, optimizer is that it reduces it reduces the 40 volt uh, to just only one volt in terms of closing it. So if we have like a, a string of like uh, uh, 20 to 25 panels instead of having like 100 volt DC power with uh, we cannot you know uh, extinguish the fire at with any way we have to just wait and look burning this site but optimizer it does it really reduces voltage from for each panel from 40 volt to 1 volt and if we have like 20 or 30 panels we will be having like only 30 volt system and it can easily be extinguished and it can be, it, it will automatically, it will shut off and uh, it will be with less hazard. Thank you very much. It, I hope that uh, I could uh, talk uh, in details uh, about the uh, optimizing as a, 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 like one of the major solutions to the installation for long-term. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Hamid. It was a very interesting discussion uh, very comprehensive and also the uh, very interesting examples of projects going on in Dubai. So thank you for your presentation. We're now mo moving on to our final speaker of this uh, webinar. Uh, this is Chris Martell, who is a head of IEA, the International Energy Agency, PVPS Task 18. He's a managing director of Global Sustainable Energy Solutions um, located in Sydney, Australia which is a renewable energy training organization that develops all of its own resource material and delivers grassroots training directly under its own brand and through its partner network, both in Australia and overseas. Uh, Chris is also the task manager for Task PVPS Task 18, which deals with off-grid and edge of grid systems. So Chris, right. are you there? Thank you. And thank yes. you so much for staying up so late uh, to give your talk. I appreciate that. Not a worry. You want me to share my screen, yeah? Yes, please. Okay. There we are. Can everyone see? Yes, that oh, looks well. good. Okay, fantastic. All right, thank, thank you, uh, David. I appreciate that introduction. Um, my presentation should be uh, on the brief side. Um, it's sort of split into two sections. Uh, as David said, I'm the manager of Task 18 for IEA PVPS. So this is going to be a little bit of a pitch for Task 18. Um, and then the last couple of slides, we'll be talking about 
uh, quality industry frameworks with the Australian example used. Um, so Taskade team formed um, in March 2020 uh, with the scope of off-grid and edge-of-grid PV systems. Um, for people that may not be aware, IEA PVPS is an international collaboration. Um, Task 18 has participation from Malaysia, Turkey, Australia, Spain, Canada, Netherlands, Germany, Indonesia, Ecuador. We also have participation from Morocco, um, who will hopefully be rejoining. Um, but we are the youngest of all of the uh, PVPS tasks. Uh, and as we formed right before coronavirus, um, building momentum for this task uh, has been slow. So um, this is kind of a pitch to see who's who might be interested to uh, to join this task. Um, our mission is to explore the techno-economic issues um, for off-grid and edge-of-grid PV systems and collaborate across borders to see where um, issues in one country might be uh, similar uh, to issues in another country and see how we can bridge those gaps. Um, some of the outputs that we've had, uh, we've, we've created a few reports so far. They're sort of listed on the left and um, there's a link uh, on the website to those reports. You can download them and have a look. And the next slide, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, um, some report highlights, uh, give you a bit of a flavor of the things that we work on. And then on the right, we've actually developed a uh, interactive case study map. Um, the case study map is currently being transitioned from, from one country to the next from, from a hosting perspective. But um, it, it's nice to see that uh, you, know, th there's, you can go in and click around and, and see the different experiences that different countries have had. And the case studies will tell you a little bit about the specifications about each system, but also some of the issues that had to be overcome. Uh, as I said before, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, one of the highlights from one of the reports. I thought that might be just a good way to give you a bit of a flavor of, of what it is that Task 18 works on. So this is a sample from the um, hybrid off-grid blueprint feasibility uh, report. Uh, basically, this is just a collaboration between countries to determine what we thought was sort of best practice for putting together a feasibility study for hybrid off-grid systems. Um, you can have a look at the report. It's, it's like a hundred or so pages long, but this is my favorite part. Uh, the, the modeling system that was used produces these topological graphs where you can compare multiple metrics on the same graph. So here in the top left, uh, we're basically looking at NPV um, based on the PV and BES, the battery system size. Um, and then on the, on the top right, we've got the internal rate of return based on PV and BES system size. You can see how that they map out quite differently to each other. But then when you lay them on top of each other, you can actually get um, uh, a way of optimizing your system size. So on the bottom left, we've got optimization based on NPV and IRR. And again, you can see in this situation, um, this little blue dot here, if you can see my mouse, might be the best case situation where you're looking to optimize on both of those things. Alternatively, you might want to optimize based on NPV and the renewable energy fraction, uh, which is the amount of renewable energy being injected into your system. Um, this is a hybrid uh, feasibility study. So hybrid in this instance includes diesel genset, in which case you might pick another number and you can lay multiple different metrics over top of each other and come up with different optimizations. It really just depends on the stakeholder uh, needs and requirements. And so in this way, uh, you can do a feasibility study with multiple different metrics and you can circle in on the requirements of your customer, depending on what their specific needs are. All right, just changing gears a little bit. Um, a precursor to task 18 is task nine. Uh, task nine was looking at uh, remote area power systems and sort of socioeconomic issues that uh, that are reflected in those, those types of systems. But one of the reports that came out of this was um, a quality training framework report, uh, which sits nicely within a quality industry framework subset. And I thought it would be interesting to sort of talk about the Australian uh, context here, because um, this, this configuration has actually been working very well for over a decade. Um, 
for a quality industry framework, it really sort of centers on four things. You need to recon, uh, recognize incentive structure. Um, that can be a carrot or a stick. In Australia, it's more of a carrot with a renewable energy target. I'll mention that in the next slide. Then you really need a quality training framework. Um, in Australia, we have a nationally recognized quality training framework. And there are units of competence, which are sort of like job task analysis, uh, same sort of thing, that govern um, what, the, what the learning requirements are for solar, battery, off-grid systems, et cetera. Next, an accreditation scheme. So there should be an accrediting body that points to all the things that are required for an individual or for a business to become accredited. And then finally, um, a quality and compliance audit scheme that sort of closes the loop on all of this and makes sure that everything that's been learned, uh, designed, installed is actually being done according to standards. So again, in Australia, um, that recognized incentive structure is being led by what we have uh, in Australia called the RET, or the Renewable Energy Target. The incentive scheme basically says that you can earn a renewable energy credit for every megawatt hour generated effectively. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's an easy way to sort of say it. Um, and so that's the dangling carrot for the industry. However, in order to create RECs, you need to be accredited. Um, and in order to be accredited, you have to, need, have to be properly trained. So on the right here, we're looking at the quality training framework. We have uh, national industry bodies that govern this quality training framework. Um, there's a group called ASQA that oversees all of the units of competence. And then below that, you have industry bodies that govern which, um, which training is required. And then we have what are called registered training organizations, our RTOs, that can take those units of competence um, and build content around that. And that's something that our company does. Um, and then we also distribute that content to other training bodies so that we can scale up um, the number of installers and designers that we have in, in Australia. Um, the accreditation scheme at the moment is owned by a group called the Clean Energy Council. So once you get your training, you can then submit to the Clean Energy Council to become accredited. Um, and if you pass a test and have the right insurances, uh, then they will issue you with a license. You have to keep your uh, license up to date by achieving professional development points. And also uh, when you get inspected by the clean energy regulator, which is the inspecting body, a federal inspecting body that I'm showing here on the right, um, the reports are passed back to the clean energy council and they can dock your license or potentially even remove your license if you're doing the wrong thing. So you can see there how that, that really closes the loop. Um, and make sure that uh, everything that's being designed and installed in Australia is being done to a specific standard. Um, and the result of that has been really quite amazing in Australia. Um, because we have such a robust industry framework, uh, the, there's really a lot of harmonization across jurisdictions. Um, everyone sort, can sort of trust that the at a, at a grassroots level, people are doing the right thing and that the system is working to ensure that that's the case. Uh, and what that's done for us is created a highly competitive environment where installation costs are below one Australian dollar per watt, which is amazing. Um, we've got about one in three solar, uh, sorry, one in three households in Australia that have solar. Um, I'm showing a little video here to show the growth of solar in Australia over the last decade. This video is actually a couple of years old already. Um, we've got over a kilowatt per capita um, in Australia. So about 26 gigawatts installed. Um, and we have forecast really strong growth into the future. You can see the last couple of years, we had a really strong uptick. That's continued even um, since I think this is 2018. This, that has continued uh, straight until now and no signs of stopping. So. Yeah, solar, solar everywhere. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much, Chris. And also for that good description of how the uh, how government can work with the private sector to help uh, initiate and to maintain good quality uh, standards uh, in, in a business such as solar PV. So that was, Chris is our last speaker. And uh, we have um, 
exceeded our one hour limit, I will need to ask the organizers there in the pavilion whether or not we have time for Q&A. We have a few questions that came in online. I don't know if there's also questions from the audience here, but if we have a few minutes, we could we could certainly see if the panelists can stay online and we could uh, go through some of these questions. So Gianni or Francesco, is, do we have some additional time or should we, do we need to shut down? Yes, please uh, go ahead for three minutes more. Uh, there are two, uh, two questions. Okay, are there questions there in the audience? Should we start with these online questions? A, one of our online participants has submitted several questions and um, they're all very good. They can all probably involve a lot of uh, discussion here, but uh, I will go ahead and start with the first one. And I think I'll jump to the last one as our second question because it's very important. But as we all recall, there was a significant failure in Texas a couple of years ago because of a very cold uh, weather system that produced a lot of ice and a lot of the uh, traditional energy infrastructure was shut down, which caused significant hardship for the people of Texas. And um, his question came in during Sean's talk, but uh, I, I can open this up to Sean first and then other, others uh, weigh in if they like, but would rooftop solar applications minimize a false such as what occurred in that, what we call the Odessa failure in Texas, which was possibly related, possibly related to inverters. Sean, do you want to start with that or? Yeah, it wasn't our fault. It was us, not us solar people. We didn't, we didn't cause that problem. <laughs> um, that sort of what I heard with, you know, with the, the Texas power problem they had when it got really cold back there, is that a lot of their infrastructure wasn't built to withstand the cold. And so you get a lot of substations and things that um, break down and that kind of hurts, you know, what's going on. If you have more solar on the grid, um, then you have less of a problem as far as needing substations and as far as needing to transmit large quantities of electricity because it's coming from the house. And then obviously too, if you have battery backup, because they obviously have more than 11 minutes per year of the grid going down, unlike Germany, um, with battery backup, then you don't have a problem. So uh, on my block, when the when the grid goes down, my lights stay on and people go, what's going on with that person? In fact, some, the big problem I have sometimes is knowing that the grid went down because of course, when the grid goes down, I want to conserve electricity so I don't run the battery down. Unless it's a nice sunny day when I charge the car. Hmm. Um, does anybody else want to talk about Texas, y'all? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, Sean. Um, there's another similar question from the same participant. Um, if PV and direct current energy storage systems become a dominant energy source for the grid. Would inverter-based systems cause any grid failure? In other words, what is the solution to the lack of reactive energy in the grid by switching over from spinning types of generation to uh, inverter type generation? Um, does, do any of our panelists want to take that on, Sean? You're jumping up there, so I guess that you will answer this. So with, with inverters and electronics, we can control all of that. There hasn't been a big need of it when solar is less than 1% more energy on the grid, energy storage, inverters, solar inverters, all, all different things. We can, make, we can make all the reactive power we want. We can control that exactly, precisely, exactly what we want, a lot easier than the rest of the grid infrastructure. We can react. But you know, we can react to um, the grid in, in real time, um, almost instantaneously. With with um, you know, so we got reactive power, uh, spinning reserves, all that kind of stuff. We can we can duplicate it. So instead of it being a problem, it's actually a benefit. So it's actually the opposite of what you know. Sometimes utilities are scared of the competition or like letting people make their own electricity. 
but um, but we're the solution, not the problem. And you have some places too where there's more um, PV on the grid, and they have to start changing their rules about how the in inverters react to power. So we have the um, in California, they have something called UL seventeen forty one SA, and that's a special. Uh, listing for an inverter so you can do things like react to the grid make reactive power hawaii has a lot of that i'm sure that germany must have a ton of that because they have you know it's, it's in australia that what one i was kind of surprised a kilowatt per person or per house something like that so um so you just have to do that and, and we can do that we have the technology yeah. 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 let me just add that it's true. Um, we have that already. We have about 10% uh, PV in our um, grid. Um, overall, which means there are grid areas and times of year where it's a, a lot. Um, so there's a way for the grid operators to curtail um, the inverters. They can do that. They can start up if there's um, a, you know, a blackout ever. And um, also, we have cascading over-frequency shutdown. So if you have something uh, going on in the grid, like we had in 2012, when there was a problem with the interconnector to Italy over the Alps, there was too much electricity um, on the grid. Um, the over-frequency shutdown of the inverter is set at different rates. Now, that's one of the things that we did in the grid. We highly recommend everybody else does too, but grid operators are in the know about this. <clears throat> David, maybe can as long I just as add a, a little bit oh, from the, yes, the, the Australian? Um, yeah, sort of just building on what uh, what the two speakers have just said. Um, in the Australian context, so the the inverters uh, have response modes, so volt, volt var, volt watt response modes, and some of the jurisdictions are now mandating that those be implemented uh, throughout, like South Australia is a good example of that. Uh, but also another very popular scheme that's occurring here is uh, virtual power plants, um, where the the battery and the solar systems can receive signals, um, and because it's an open market, um, they can all be grouped up and aggregated, and they can play actually on the the wholesale FCAS market, which is our frequency market, and the the wholesale arbitrage market. So that's another way of making sure that you have grid stability um, using market mechanisms. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Chris. Any other of our panelists or anybody have additional comments? I have I have one question here I'd like to pose to the panelists, and I think maybe I could, I think both David and especially Sean uh, mentioned this in their presentations, and that is, um, I guess the way I'd like to phrase the question, what are the barriers that utilities are throwing up or, or concerned about regarding bi-directional charging. I mean, I think, Sean, you showed some very valuable statistics as to what the storage potential will exist out there as we have, you know, the massive growth of EVs uh, all over the world. But I know, for example, here in the U.S., so you gave the example of Duke Energy providing some uh, case studies, and I think XL Energy is doing one here in Boulder, Colorado. But by and large, it seems like it's very slow for utilities to become, to embrace the idea of bi-directional charging. And is that just due to their lack of knowledge as to what would be coming into the grid or what's available to the grid? Or what are, what are, the, what are the barriers that we need to overcome to move this forward? David, maybe you, I, if you could start and then maybe Sean, you'd have some comments. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave really soon. I would love to okay. take over with my comment with, with my other panelists. But um, they, so I think that the, problem, the, the solution here is our digitalization. It's actually something where the Germans aren't particularly good on the grid. Uh, they are, and other things we have learned in the pandemic 
that we are not, but we are getting better. So you have it's about information, about real time information, um, like you said. And what we have noticed everywhere, at least where we have the grid, we have the internet. So um, often the inverters already have the technology and there's a big uh, uh, lobbying fight in Germany about having smart meters and, and extra devices uh, where the devices are already there. Usually they're in the electric car, they're in the smart battery or in the smart inverter. And so that information can be aggregated. And we have seen that in other more liberal markets namely in the US and um, in some of the, the, the states um, that this information is becoming available. That said, um, you know, good grid management um, and having, uh, you know, redundant infrastructure is really um, important and somebody who, who manage, manages the grid, uh, you know, and has a stake um, in nothing going wrong. Yeah, so I I think that the biggest barrier that we have is the electric vehicle manufacturers themselves. Because if you go bi-directional, if you figure out how to make it work, you void the warranty. And then also with an electric vehicle, if you want to be able to, you know, backfeed the grid with an electric vehicle, you have to have the inverter listed at, with the UL1741 listing for doing that, for exporting it to the grid. So we're just not there yet. But the thing is, is pretty soon because the, the amount of electric vehicles being sold right now is just going up like crazy. And pretty soon the grid is not gonna work if we don't do this. And so pretty soon the electric vehicles uh, manufacturers and the utilities, which would be another barrier, are gonna insist that we do this because they're gonna need all that energy storage to make it work. Right now with the grid, we go up and down as far as like, like our, our peaks and troughs with our demand. And, um, and what we're producing when we're making electricity, sending it back to, to the grid. And if we can stabilize that with these huge four-wheeled batteries, um, then actually we can get a whole lot more electricity over those same lines. They call it transmission and distribution deferral. So that means you, know, you don't need to go build new power plants, new power lines, all that kind of stuff, because you have these great energy reserves that are in your batteries which why not just have them in your cars? Um, perhaps one of the reasons why the electric vehicle manufacturers are not all excited about letting you export to the grid is because Tesla, then they can sell you a power wall, <laughs> um, that, you know, like a, a home battery. And it's kind of funny that if you add up the price of enough power walls to equal how much your car costs, it's about the same. So you can buy your batteries with or without wheels. The only problem is right now, we can't export with our wheels, but now the Ford is doing that with their F-150. And I think two years from now, it's gonna be a whole different story. That's my prediction. So. Maybe I can add it up something to this. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, actually, actually, there there was like a year, uh, like three four months back in Norway. It was about e summit, and about the increase of this uh, electric vehicle in the country in Norway. They were like, uh, uh, they were talking about collapse of the grid because of the uh, extra charges which are uh, which has to be given to the cars. But, uh, you know, uh, looking at that subject, they were talking about a smart EV chargers, you know, that uh, ca can communicate with the uh, grid, you know, to, to stabilize the charging. Uh, suppose uh, there is a charging station in a place, they, they, they need to, you know, uh, a lot of cars, uh, you know, uh, down the line, we can see, you know, a lot of electric cars to be replaced uh, uh, combustion engines so what uh, it is uh, totally uh, you know not meaningful to supply grid with a battery you know uh, the cost of you know uh, energy generated by battery uh, it is much more than uh, whatever sources a solar system or uh, you know even off-grid system the, the cost of off-grid system is much more uh, less than you know charge uh, batteries in the car so maybe it can be utilized those sources of like 100 kilowatt hour in a best scenario, 150 kilowatt hour in like uh, off-road uh, EV chargers. So what can uh, those uh, batteries help the grid 
you know, it, it, it is really not meaningful once we want to charge, uh, you know, bunch of uh, EVs with, uh, you know, uh, power. Uh, but the, the opposite is very much true that when uh, the numbers of electric vehicle increase, the uh, how to charge those cars, uh, you know, some people, uh, innovative people from uh, Holland, you know, the light year people, they are putting like uh, two, three kilowatt uh, peak uh, uh, PV system on top of the car. And then they, they are uh, like uh, planning to charge the uh, EV for, for example, for um, uh, like uh, 10 to 15 kilowatt hour per day. And then it can give them a, like a 20 kilometer or I don't know, maximum 50 kilometer per day. So whatever uh, charge, you know, uh, the amount in the car, we are talking about a small batteries. Those are not very meaningful. However, the opposite subject to be discussed further, how to optimize a smart EVs. You know, if a lot of chargers are there, how those EVs to be a much more optimized and charge uh, cars not in a fast mode because everybody's talking about like fast charging mode, like to, to charge the EV within uh, 10 minutes, uh, like 100 kilowatt hour to, to or 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So everybody was worried that this can lead to the collapse of the grid in everywhere if the numbers of EVs, you know, uh, increases. So, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to add this topic. I don't know how much meaningful it is. Yeah. No, very helpful. Thank you, Hamid. Are there any other comments on or questions? I think we... I appreciate everybody being willing to stay on a little bit beyond the one hour time limit. Um, I don't see anything more coming in. I don't know if people there in the uh, in the pavilion would like to make any closing comments, but I, for one, will want to once again, thank all of our panelists, as well as our participants to this webinar. It was very interesting. I found in, in a very important set of topics that were presented today regarding the the role of rooftop solar and, and the role of that EV battery storage coming into the grids. So we had a lot of very interesting and varied discussions. Um, and so I will say my final thank you to all. And if there's anybody there in the pavilion that wants to make closing comments, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you very Goodbye much. From my side. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, actually, this is uh, the last of the nine events we had uh, at COP27 uh, about uh, the meetings, uh, discussion, etc. Uh, we did the bring on the table uh, a lot of topics, you know, starting from uh, PV and agriculture, PV and biodiversity. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, how to speed up a GIGA project to accelerate the transition, energy security policy. Um, we've been talking about distributed PV um, and our campaign results on the potential benchmarking on authorization processes and the regulation and uh, also for large scale project uh, and uh, uh, we had a session on Africa, we had a session on uh, um, Latin America uh, and also we had uh, a session this morning on Southeast Asia representing all the challenges of the market and also we launched uh, uh, the approach uh, with uh, starting from Asia on uh, open to people, individuals, organization that want to commit on uh, uh, solar PV installation or rooftop, etc. And uh, we launched the alliance, uh, the global uh, renewable alliance uh, with hydrogen, uh, with uh, um, the um, uh, hydro uh, the association of WGWEC with uh, uh, the green hydrogen, with the uh, storage association, geothermal, and so on. Uh, we so let me say this is uh, has been full of uh, events, meetings, ministers, prime ministers also here uh, from Tunisia, Italy, Spain, uh, um, and uh, Ireland, uh, and a lot of media, etc. So let, let's say thank you uh, a lot. Thank you to all the sponsors. Uh, 
from Avarenko, uh, from, of course, uh, Mesa with a group of Pool Energy and, uh, and of course, uh, Genco Solar, um, um, Avarenko supported by Solar Power Europe and Light Source VP. And I'd like to conclude with our institutional video that we did launch also at, as a first release uh, in, uh, during the COP, and, uh, and we conclude with that. Come for a last picture, I'll say everybody knows <laughs> it's the last event so of uh, the COP. Thank you all uh, connected here and uh, thank you Dave uh, and all the other speakers for this coordination. So we do a last picture and uh, we, uh, let me say, we have another day, but uh, we conclude at least this part. Another one, and another screen. One more, one more. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. 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 Very good.